I'd like to talk tonight about values. And um, I'm guessing most people in the audience are going to have values. It's not a far stretch. It's a pretty safe bet that pretty much everybody in the audience has values. Things you think are really important, things you think are central in life, ideas about what is really real in this universe, in reality. And here's another not very far-fetched guess. All of us are going to have somewhat different values. And if you take the people who are farthest from one another, in terms of values, they're going to be quite different. So people in this room would have different core values, and of course, a bunch of the core values that we might even be prepared to die for if we needed to. Values that are more important to us than life itself. And then we have lots of other values, less central ones, more debatable ones. Values that we might even trade. So, um, if we zoom out a bit, we can see that if we look at this group as a whole, the people in, gathered in a, in a place like this, in a time like this, and we compare it to people, let's say, 300 years ago, also in Berlin, maybe, or maybe 500 years ago, a gathering like this, let's say, in a cathedral, would have completely different values. It would have, I guess you could say, medieval values. And people in this room would have, well, what values do we have, really? And another question that presents itself, how do you know if you have the right values? How do you know if you have good values, if they make sense? It's an important question because look at it, it's how absurd it really is that all of us have the values we have because we think those are the right values. So we believe that out of all the 100 plus, or I don't know how many people are in the room, you have the best values. And we all believe that. And we can't all be right. Or maybe we can in some deeper sense. And, uh, and that's part of what we're going to talk about. So we need sometimes some ways to approach sets of values, or families of values, groups of values, structures of values, or bigger stories, as a former speaker told us about. And um, I'm going to talk then about three very different families or sets of values. And some of these values grow on the shoulders of others. So what I'm proposing then is a developmental view of value systems. I'm going to talk about modern values, about postmodern values, and about meta-modern values. And meta-modern values being the ones that I personally subscribe to and I believe are a bit more the values of the future. And the developmental view, then, one way of looking at it is that you compare sets of values by looking at what builds on what. If you, if you are really consequential with the modern values, they will lead you, eventually, by the crude necessities of logic, they will lead you to postmodern conclusions. And if you really imbibe the postmodern values, and you really embody them, and you go through them for decades, or as a big culture, you work through them again and again. You twist them, and you turn them, and you use them, and you turn them. You end up at a new position. You end up at the metamodern position. You end up with metamodern values. And each of these sets is a big family. Or, if you like, you can think of them as castles. Because the modern values then have so many different, a thousand different assumptions that are made, a thousand different assumptions that strengthen one another. And they form a, co a coherent system, a system that coheres. And on the ruins of that castle is where you build your postmodern worldview. 
and you build your postmodern life and your postmodern relationships and your postmodern identities and institutions and laws and your postmodern art. And then there is a third step, the metamodern castle, which is only beginning to, to be built, as I and many other observers believe. So what are modern values? Let's begin there. I'm guessing everybody in this room is going to know them by heart, more or less. There is a belief in rationality. There is a belief in science. There is a belief in progress. There is a belief in the dignity of humanity, or as the modern values classically put it, the dignity of man, even. These are, of course, the, the values of the Enlightenment. And there is a connection, then, between the belief in science and rationality and the democratic project, just as we use, each of us use our individual senses and we look together at, at nature and we use the, the methods of science and science gives us the answers and we can use these answers to create progress. In the same way we can do it in our political system. We can use our votes, we can use our open discussions, we can use our free speech we will find, by means of, with a bit of a technical term, intersubjective verification. I check facts, I check your facts, you check mine. I check your theories, you check mine. And together, then, we create, we approach the truth, and together we create progress. And progress, then, creates an improvement, like an accumulative improvement upon human life. And if we look back 200 years since, since the Enlightenment and we look at, uh, at, let's say, the French Revolution, the conservatives of that time, they didn't turn out to be right. You can see that the most radical minds of that time won out in the long run. Sure, the French Revolution itself uh, collapsed. But if you look at the, the values of the Enlightenment, they inform every aspect of our societies and every aspect of our lives. We're almost brainwashed by this stuff since we're little kids. So we all believe in human rights, and we all believe in, in um, science and progress and these things. And, and we view ourselves as rational citizens, and we relate to a world out there, nature. But the problem is then that modern life itself has produced a bunch of problems. It resolved many problems. Yes, it resolved maybe wars between democratic countries. That's not really happening anymore. It resolved um, um, poverty. It resolved uh, deprivation of different kinds. Epidemics also more or less stopped. There's no more starvation. Uh, we aren't oppressed by our governments in the same... Not for the time being, at, le at last least. And, um, but it also then produced a bunch of new problems, and these problems have to do with, actually all three have been mentioned, two of them quite, quite explicitly and one a bit less, more implicitly. Um, the first is sustainability, that the modern project isn't sustainable. It's going to crash sooner or later, and everybody can tell. And it's not very difficult to tell either. And that's what the sciences themselves are telling us. And the second big problem is, of course, the rampant inequality of the world. So if this is such a rational world, why is it distributing the wealth and the abundance and the securities and the opportunities so unfairly and so rationally? And the third one is a bit more subtle, and it has to do with this word alienation. That in the most modern countries where modernity has progressed the most, you find also a very high instance of mental health issues among young people, a lack of meaning, a lack of faith in life, a lack of direction. And, and people take all sorts of drugs for these things, and, and it's just a growing issue, and we don't know what to do with it. And from these late modern societies, when this has progressed a long time, you see a subtle revolution happening, often around humanities, 
um, departments and, and universities, around the counterculture of the US, around um, critical media, around investigative journalists, around sophisticated artists and philosophers, and around maybe importers of Eastern religion into, into Western society. And this is where the postmodern values enter. There's a, a sense that we have imbibed so much of the modern world and we, and we actually make us, makes us a bit sick. And we no longer, it doesn't ring true when it says well, this, is, this is progress. Well, wait a minute, say, says the postmodern mind. If you're so rational, how come we can make a scientific study of, let's say, medical sciences, and we will find all sorts of economic interests steering which, which questions are asked in the first place? Or how about uh, the exclusion of minorities and the exclusion of many other narratives or, or, or stories? from the big story of progress? And how about the destruction of small cultures that touch upon this big behemoth of global modern culture and can't really take it and are destroyed as they touch them? For instance, Greenlanders when they were colonized by the, by the Danes. Yes, they got modernity, but they, become, they became, uh, many of them, um, alcoholics at the bottom of Danish society and was a great tragedy as, as the, that society was ripped apart. So the postmodern project is a project of critique. The postmodern mind says, even if I look at this human being that you're telling me is at the center of the universe, even if I look at it with the very methods you're telling me to look at it with, with the methods of science and the methods of experimental psychology and so forth, and there's not a shred of rationality there. And there's no individual. The person is steered by the language structures they're part of, the, the culture they're a part of, the context they're in, the narratives. And the, these are usually invisible to us, as an earlier speaker also talked about. So, so there's a resistance, but but where does the postmodern critique lead? In late modern societies, you have a growing minority of postmodern populations. In places like Denmark and Sweden, uh, these populations even perhaps dominate to some extent the, the, the political and at least the media, life of media and politics and, and the di overall debate and discourse. So, doesn't really take us anywhere specific. We kind of lose our direction because if if the modern postmodern mind says, wait a minute, I can't you can't say there is this big story of progress. You can't say that modern society is better than Greenland society in its tribal form or better than, than medieval society in Europe that came before it. Well how then can you how then can you justify your own position? How then can you say that a feminist, gendered, anti-humanist uh, critique of, of, modern, of modern thinking is better? So we, you kind of lose direction. and you, you develop a kind of irony, a kind of distancing from the sincerity of the modern project. The postmodern says, mind says, I don't want to be the sucker. I don't want to be at the short end of the stick. I don't want to be fooled by some, by some structure or power relation that is beyond me. And all of this then leaves out the belief in progress, the sincerity that was there in the modern project. We don't have anywhere to go. Enter metamodern values. Metamodern values then represent a marriage of two worlds, rather than a culture war that we see today. Ra we see a rampant culture war in pretty much all Western societies, US being the, the prime example between modern values and postmodern values. And the metamodern mind says, actually, I I'm going to say you're both right. 
and then I'm gonna synthesize it, and I'm going to go ahead and build something from there. So it says, yes, there is a dir direction of, directionality of progress. And this progress is not so much one of science and objectively seeing the world, but a progress of perspective, a progress of the soul, if you like, a progress of human emotional and personal development. And that, of course, is a controversial thing to say, because then you're saying that people with, po with modern values have not yet developed to have postmodern values. And you're saying that people with postmodern values have not yet developed to have metamodern values. But I think it is a less judgmental position for this reason. In the postmodern mind, if you look at, the modern, at, at modern society without a developmental lens, you can't really say, you can't really look at it non judgmentally. You can't really say, what does this person lack? to become more postmodern? What does this person lack to, to take a more critical stance and not fly all around the world for no good reason or not wanting to, uh, to uh, redistribute wealth and so forth? So the more complex worldviews require more subtle fuels. They require us to think more subtly. They require us to feel more subtly. They require stronger, healthier selves. They require more abstract and more profound senses of solidarity and ident identification. And how do you create that? This in itself, this developmental path, becomes the center or core of the metamodern value system. So you begin to value things that would help populations develop into later stages of ethical or value development. And what, what can those changes be? Well, for instance, you can support projects such as meditation in schools, which helps us calm our own minds and develop empathy, compassion, you can have uh, support structures, psychological support structures, because everybody is going to be wounded as a child, and sooner or later, later they're going to need some kind of support or help to not have their trajectory messed up, to not get on the defensive, to not get overinvested in ideas and so forth, and you need to use the methods of science to find out how to support such inner growth in wider populations. And if we don't, we cannot expect, in scientific behavioral terms, we cannot expect people to have values that are going to match the complexities of the transnational, global, post-industrial, digital age. So it is only if we outgrow modernity, if it's only if we outgrow the modern values that we have been taught to live with, that we can resolve the modern problems. Again, these being sustainability, inequality, and alienation, the whole in our soul that modern life produces. This is a path that is offered uniquely by the metamodern set of values and is not offered by the postmodern set of values. Thank you very much.